So good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here. It's wonderful that we are together again. Um, uh, we're going to have now the, uh, the talk by Professor Lemon on Richard uh, II and Elizabethan politics. Just to remind our, our uh, game plan here, uh, we have a roughly 50-minute exposition up to 10 o'clock. Then we have a coffee break. Then Professor Ronaldo Porto Macedo uh, will comment on the paper, and then we open for debates. I think that's, that's worked beautifully yesterday. I hope it works equally well today. And uh, thank you, Professor Lemon, please. All right, is this working? Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Uh, all right, so thank you all. I'm looking forward to today. And uh, I just want to start, first of all, by Thanking Jose so much for just this amazing hospitality. You've been just an ideal host, and uh, and I think both Arthur and I are just so appreciative. Um, and then also thanking you all for just a really marvelous set of questions and conversations yesterday, and I'm looking forward to, um, to continuing that today. So we spoke a lot yesterday about Shakespeare, and obviously I'm hoping that we'll continue to do that today. But I thought I would begin today's seminar by asking a really obvious basic question, which is, what is political theory? In the original Greek, the word theory condenses three distinct activities. The first is thea, which means something seen, a spectacle, or an occurrence. So that's T-H-E-A, thea. The second, theorin means to look at, to observe what is going on. So theorin is looking at and observing what's going on. And then finally, theoros signifies an intelligent observer, one who looks at what is going on and tries to understand it. So that's theoros. Only at the end of this process do we have theorem, the conclusion, the theorem that comes from theory. So if we separate out these current meanings of our word theory, the meaning of theory as spectacle or intelligent observer, and also the meaning of theory as theorem, then we can retain a sense of theory, or specifically of political theory, as something that isn't merely a conclusion. Instead, it's an investigation. Theorizing, we might say, is an effort to understand <coughs> It is not validating or proving a conclusion. Oh, can nobody hear? Yes, no, just because we are recording. Oh, okay. okay. Can you hear now? Yeah, it's okay. All right. <laughs> As you can tell, I'm a little bit shy about like a massive <laughs> I microphone. I don't like it either. <laughs> so, <laughs> Thank you. Right. Um, so theorizing, we might say, is an effort to understand. It's not validating or proving a conclusion. It's instead a process of discovery or inquiry. When we retain this original sense of political theory as a process of investigation, we can see that our conference might be called not Shakespeare and political theory, but instead Shakespeare as political theory. For Shakespeare, as we know, is a supreme investigator. He is the intelligent observer par excellence, the one who looks at what is going on and tries to understand it. And he is not only the theoros, the intelligent observer, but his works obviously represent thea, spectacle, or occurrence, because his works, of course, are theater. And in fact, thea, spectacle, or observe, is, is the root of theater. <coughs> so my paper today is an effort to show Shakespeare as political theorist through a case study of his play, Richard II. Seeing Shakespeare as political theorist exposes how his works not only contribute to political debate, but offer what we might understand as the era's best political theory over and against the instrumentalist writings we might now deem the political texts of the era. I will develop this argument in three stages. First, setting out by setting out the political problems Shakespeare is investigating. In this case, problems of succession and tyranny. Second, by tracking a potential solution to this problem of succession and tyranny 
in the political texts widely taken to influence Shakespeare. And third, by turning to Shakespeare's own response to this problem in Richard II, a response that is, unlike the so-called political theory surrounding him, indeed truly theoretical, truly investigatory, and truly spectacular. Having explored Shakespeare as political theorist, I will then end with a brief fourth section, meditating on Shakespeare's conclusion to his theoretical investigations. Uh, so before I start into the text about the problem of succession and tyranny, I'll just say a couple of words about Richard II as a play, because I imagine that some of you are not as familiar with Richard II as you might be with Hamlet um, or, or Midsummer Night's Dream. So Richard II is uh, part of what's called Shakespeare's second tetralogy. His first tetralogy, tetralogy meaning four plays, concerned the Wars of the Roses, so a civil war that had ravaged England. Uh, and so these, this first tetralogy includes Richard III and the three Henry VI plays. And these were very popular history plays that Shakespeare did fairly early in his career. And he then turns to in what's called the second tetralogy, which includes Richard II, the Henry IV plays, and Henry V, which we spoke about so much yesterday. In this second tetralogy, he turns to the beginning of the War of the Roses. And he basically is positing the question, what began this war that I just staged for all of you, my loyal fans? So he's going backwards in time to the period of 1399, when Richard II rules tyrannically and is then deposed. So that's the story that he's telling. And he's telling this story in Richard II of the kind of beginnings of the War of the Roses to an audience that would be very well informed about this civil war, because they just saw all of his plays on that exact topic. Um, the other thing I'll say about Richard II, just as a pitch for those of you who haven't read it, is that unlike uh, the first tetralogy, Richard III and the Henry VI plays, Richard II is a tragedy. It's actually labeled the tragedy of Richard II. Um, and there's been a lot of ink spilt on that issue because it's a history and a tragedy. And I think we can call it a tragedy because Richard II is a very carefully defined psychological character in the way that we see somebody like Hamlet later on. He has many really beautiful soliloquies, and he himself, especially after his fall, is quite a charismatic kind of character. So, so it's just to say it has some of you know, Shakespeare's most beautiful poetry, in my humble opinion, and it is really worth a, a read. All right, so part one, the problem. The censorship of Rich Shakespeare's Richard II, oh, that's the other thing that's a little bit of context for this play, is it's one of the few plays other than Macbeth that is actually associated with a particular event in Shakespeare's lifetime. So it's associated with this rebellion by the Earl of Essex because when the Earl re rebelled in 1601 against Elizabeth. He had been shut out of her favor. He had had his um, various livings dried up because his opponents at court had argued against him. So when the Earl of Essex and all of his friends rebelled in London, they had a performance of Richard II the night before the rebellion. So for a long time, scholars have hypothesized that actually this is a play that encouraged revolution. And furthermore, it's a play that has a certain degree of um, of the, um, what's the word for it? Uh, I'm like, English is my first language and I can't find the word. Um, <laughs> so, so, it's like, uh, so, so that's just to say, when you guys have your questions, like, please, you know, I'm like, I'm so impressed with all of you um, having, being so bilingual. Um, but uh, there are traces of censorship for, um, it, for this play. So these are the reasons that people have been quite interested in it as a kind of revolutionary text. So I'm just going to debunk some of those things I just said, though. All right, so part one, the problem. The censorship of Shakespeare's Richard II, including the deposition scene, along with the commissioning of the play the night before the Essex Rising and the comment of Elizabeth I in response to this rising and the play, quote, I am Richard II, know ye not that, have led to decades of analysis on how the play shadows the potential deposition of Elizabeth herself. Did the play spur the Essex rebels against the queen? Did the queen see herself in the play's fallen monarch? Did her advisors recognize the parallel as well, thereby ordering the play's censorship? 
Well, readings of the play might have hinged on these direct relations of Richard II to Elizabethan state politics, the play's censorship, the rebels' commissioning, and Elizabeth's comment. Recent critics have challenged every one of these suppositions. Cynthia Clegg carefully considers the alleged censorship of the play, only to conclude that the fourth quarto's expanded deposition scene might not represent press censorship, but merely expansion and revision. Paul Hammer, a, a historian who works on Essex, has argued that if, the Shakespeare's, if Shakespeare's play was indeed commissioned the night before the Essex Rising, it was a mere coincidence. The Rising was not a planned event, but instead an unexpected skirmish. Finally, the Queen's comment, I am Richard II, know you not that, has been deemed questionable, being published years after its supposed delivery. In short, there is no evidence that the performance of Shakespeare's play was used as a spur to immediate action against Elizabeth or her advisors. And there is firm evidence the play provoked, uh, and there is little firm evidence the play provoked royal or state disapproval in the way scholars hypothesized. Richard II does, however, address some of the most crucial political questions of the Elizabethan era. Succession, tyranny, divine right monarchy, popularity, favoritism, state expenditure, and military involvement in Ireland are among some of the issues that define both late Elizabethan political conversation and the play. Scholars have in explored such connections. They have suggested how the play might shadow Elizabethan policy, be it in Ireland or at court with favorites such as Leicester or Essex. They have also studied how the play might challenge or bolster the Elizabethan state in its representation of the deposition of an English king. That's the other thing. It's the one play that has an English king that is being deposed and, and actually murdered in the play. Most pointedly, connecting the play to Catholic resistance theory, scholars establish how the tyrannical, illegitimate rule of Richard II mirrors the government of Elizabeth, trespassing law and custom and therefore prompting allegedly legitimate deposition. This talk contributes to discussions of Elizabeth II in relation to Elizabethan politics from a different angle. Rather than viewing the play through the prism of Elizabeth and her advisors and the English state, I examine the play through the lens of European political thought and the forms of kingship which England might experience when a new and most likely foreign monarch, such as James VI of Scotland or Philip II of Spain, come to sit on its throne. In the period after the execution of Mary, Queen of Scots in 1587, and the resulting war with Philip II of Spain, in the period of wars in the Low Countries, with English troops defending the Protestant Dutch against the Spanish, and in the period just after the conversion of the French King Henry IV to Catholicism in 1593, England stood in embattled relation to Catholic Europe and particularly to Spain. Yet Philip II, former King of England by his marriage to Mary I, and through his rule of Portugal, alleged descendant of John of Gaunt, had a claim to the throne repeatedly asserted by English Catholic recusants most vehemently Robert Parsons, whose pamphlet, A Conference About the Next Succession to England, appeared the year before Shakespeare's play. Repositioning Shakespeare's Richard II in relation to European debates on succession, tyrannicide, and sovereignty illuminates the play's timely engagement with contemporary political issues, while at the same time avoiding the critical acrobatics necessary to read the play as a political allegory of the Elizabethan court itself. By the 1590s, Elizabeth made an unlikely Richard. In contrast to Shakespeare's king, she was neither young, tyrannical, impulsive, lawless, nor easily led. This is not to say she was free from the charge of tyranny. The execution of Mary, Queen of Scots, and the cutting of John Stubbs's writing hand, to give two examples, earned her notoriety. Further, her more radical Catholic subjects deemed her recusancy policies, which we heard about yesterday a bit, a sign of her tyranny, while Stubbs, John Goodman, and John Knox wrote against female rule as inherently unlawful and tyrannical. <laughs> 
But by 1595, the year of the play, Elizabeth's eminent demise, she was 62 when the play was first performed, which doesn't sound that old to us, but given the lifespan of, of Elizabethans is actually quite phenomenal. And the rule of her potential successor were more immediate concerns than her mode of governance over the last four decades. To argue that Shakespeare wrote a play in the 1590s counseling Elizabeth to rule more justly or threatening her with deposition seems unlikely. That Shakespeare wrote a play about succession and the fear of a future ruler's potential absolutism and tyranny is indisputable. By the 1590s, succession, despite Elizabeth's efforts to the contrary, had become the dominant political topic. The Queen's advisors had pressed her to secure a future ruler for England. In the face of her resistance and her injunction forbidding conversations on succession, her advisors nevertheless conducted clandestine <laughs> negotiations, and that includes both the Earl of Essex and Robert Cecil, who conducted clandestine negotiations with James of Scotland. Further, her subjects aired their fears about succession, tyranny, and their hopes for a legitimate ruler in print. The attacks on the tyranny of Philip II in the state of Christendom, which is a manuscript that was composed the year before Shakespeare's play and which I'll return to. Uh, so this pamphlet on the one hand, and then the praise for a Spanish successor in the Catholic resistance theory of Parsons and Cardinal William Allen on the other, are the most exact obvious examples of such writings on succession. These writings on succession are deeply involved in particular rulers and lobby for their favorite contenders, whether it's Philip II or James. But regardless of the instrumentality of these tracts and their divergent views on succession, all share a common concern. All condemn tyranny and speculate on appropriate responses to it. The discussion of tyranny, and specifically the discussion on the legitimacy of tyrannicide, runs through these tracks regardless of political or religious allegiance. The key political conversation in the second half of the 16th century then concerns succession specifically as it related to the dilemma of bad rule. Furthermore, by the 1590s, this conversation pointedly centered on potential successors to Elizabeth herself. Shakespeare's play clearly participates in this contemporary political conversation. In his absolutist style of rule, Shakespeare's Richard II encapsulates fears about Elizabeth's potential successor. This successor may be real, James or Philip, but for the play's purposes, the successor is more powerfully merely imagined. Rather than positing Richard II as one particular foreign ruler, he stands instead for the threat of the future namely the threat of a successor emerging from a political landscape marked by tyrannical rule. Richard threatens property rights, eliminates his opposition, and insists on his right to govern above the law. In depicting such errancy, Shakespeare not only stages the specter of tyrannical leadership before his audience, he also locates the origins of this tyranny, <coughs> as I shall illuminate below. So just to situate this, what I'm trying to suggest is that if we're reading Shakespeare's plays allegorically, which people love to do in relation to politics, if part of what interests political theorists in Shakespeare is to say, this character equals this person, I'm trying to resituate Richard II to say, for Shakespeare's audience, they wouldn't be interested in a direct comparison with the Elizabethan regime, but instead with something that is much more pressing, which is the threat of the future. The play opens on the king's tyranny. Richard has commissioned the murder of one of his subjects, the Duke of Gloucester, and now Bolingbroke directly confronts the man guilty of the crime, Mowbray. This confrontation poses a serious problem for Richard, which he solves by banishing both men. In doing so, he exhibits the self-interest of the tyrant, systematically eliminating his own opponents. The king's next political decision is equally tyrannous, he illegally seizes Gaunt's estate on his death. The king thus transgresses one of the most fundamental rights of subjects, namely the right of meum and tuum, of property ownership. This action prompts the king's faithful advisor, York, to warn, quote, if you do wrongfully seize Gaunt's estate, you pluck a thousand dangers on your head, 
you lose a thousand well-disposed hearts. York informs Richard and the play's audience that by ignoring the legal parameters governing his office and by seizing private property, the king undermines his own rule. He does so not only because he challenges the very process of succession whereby he gained the throne. York asks, how art thou king but by fair sequence and succession? But also he undermines his rule because he prompts Bolingbroke to revolt. Exiled and disinherited, Bolingbroke is punished as a traitor before he has even committed the act. The punishment for treason, unlike most other crimes, included disinheritance. As a result, Bolingbroke has little left to lose. His attempt at legal action in the trial by battle, which is the first scene of the play, was denied. He now suffers the fate of, tra of a traitor in being disinherited because his father, Gaunt's estate, has been seized and his most obvious recourse to gain his estate lies in rebellion. Richard's suspension of law, commissioning the murder of Gloucester, banishing Bolingbroke and Mowbray, and seizing Bolingbroke's estate, thus provokes a political crisis. Richard has veered into tyranny. Loyal subjects, Gaunt and York, inform the king of this fact and attempt to counsel him toward good rule. Gaunt famously warns Richard that his kingdom, and this is one of the most famous speeches of the play, is now leased out, bound in shame with inky blots and rot rotten parchment bonds. But the king's ears are stopped with flattering sounds, lascivious meters, eager feeding, and light vanity. Like all tyrant tyrants, he refuses to listen to sound advice. Too late comes counsel to be heard. After Gaunt and York, then Ross, Willoughby, and Northumberland, other, plays, uh, other characters in the play, also catalog Richard's corruptions, namely his grievous taxes, his new exactions, blanks, benevolences, burdenous taxations, and dissolution. These men struggle to respond to ill rule, and Richard ignores them as well. As a result, they face a dilemma, one familiar to Shakespeare's contemporaries. How should loyal subjects respond to tyranny? Part two, Shakespeare's contemporaries. This question, how should loyal subjects respond to tyranny, dominated European political debate in the late 16th century. Early modern writers, whether sovereignty or resistance theorists, Catholics or reformed Protestants, lawyers or polemicists, unite in condemning tyranny and these writers all concur on its definition. A tyrant is a ruler who breaks his or her country's laws in the name of pleasure. Thus, Henry of Bracton writes, the name Tyrannus and not Rex belongs to the person set up as king when his pleasure and not the law prevails. This definition reappears in the work of various lawyers, Sir John Fortescue, as well as Sir Thomas Smith. Thomas Smith writes that a tyrant breaketh laws already made at his pleasure. Sovereignty theorists, including the French Catholic Jean Baudin and the Scottish James VI, also link tyranny and pleasure. Baudin writes, quote, now the greatest difference betwixt a king and a tyrant is the one measureth his manners according to his laws, the other measureth his laws according to his own disposition and pleasure. While James VI calls a tyrant one who, quote, inverts all good laws to serve only for his unruly private affections. Resistance theorists concur. The author of Vindiciae contra Tyrannos, likely the Huguenot writer de Mornay, deems tyrants those who, quote, think whatever they desire is permitted them, who can in no way endure the voice of reason and law, while Parsons offers a standard definition of tyranny as the trespass of law. Quote, kings shall govern according to law and equity, which end being taken away or perverted, the king becometh a tyrant. While these sovereignty theorists and resistance pamphleteers might concur on the definition of tyranny, they diverge sharply on the appropriate response to it. To begin with the sovereignty theorists, they vehemently argue for no response. Subjects should remain absolutely obedient to their ruler even when he proves a tyrant. 
And subjects should remain obedient because kings, as we heard about yesterday, have divine rights. Monarchs are, according to these sovereignty theorists, appointed by God and they rule above the law. A passage from 1 Samuel provides the biblical support for the divinity of rulers and the non-resistance of subjects when Samuel tells the people of Israel that they will suffer at the hands of a tyrant, quote, and he will take your fields and your vineyards and your best olive trees. And the quote goes on to say he'll also take your daughters and he'll take your wives and you can't do anything about it. Calvin writes of these biblical verses that, quote, certainly these things could not be done legally by kings, but the people are bound to obey and could not lawfully resist, as if Samuel had said, to such a degree will kings indulge in tyranny, which it will not be for you to restrain, end of quote. Bodan and James VI also cite this passage as support for absolute obedience. Bodan writes that it is illegal for any subject to make an attempt on the honor or the life of the monarch, even if he has committed all the misdeeds, impieties, and cruelties one could mention. James concurs, writing that, quote, a wicked king is sent by God for a curse to his people and a plague for their sins, but that it is lawful for them to shake off that curse at their own hand, which God hath laid on them, that I deny and may do so justly. Each of these theorists defends absolute obedience in the case of tyranny on the grounds of the king's divine appointment. The king is sent by, by God and must be obeyed like God. The theory of the divine right of kings, developed by Calvin, Bodin, and James, and the doctrine of absolute obedience, supported in 1 Samuel, gained its political teeth in England after the split from Rome and the subsequent excommunication by the Pope of Henry VIII and Elizabeth I. And again, this dovetails with our talk yesterday. These English monarchs claimed godly sovereignty in the wake of the papal deposing power. The Elizabethan advocacy of divine right appears in such royal sources as the government issued homily against disobedience and willful rebellion, which cites biblical verses for the divinity of kings and associates resistance to monarchical power with damnation. So this is from the homily, quote, it is most evident that kings, queens, and other princes are ordained of God, are to be obeyed and honored of their subjects, subjects as are disobedient or rebellious against their princes disobey God and procure their own damnation. So in other words, after the split from Rome, English monarchs had to justify their own rule and themselves via a relationship to God that now disappeared in the sense that the relationship to the Pope disappeared. So they, they moved away from the Pope and instead asserted a direct relationship with God. That meant that they themselves had been directly appointed by God and ruled with that kind of godly authority that was under attack by their Catholic resisting subjects. All right, so just to put this in context, these sovereignty theorists are arguing for a kind of absolute obedience that means in the modern day were we to live in a state where we experienced hideous tyranny, we would be counseled to do nothing, not to resist, not to complain. We might try to counsel a good ruler, whether it's, you know, you can think of any fascist from the 20th century that you want to insert. We might try to counsel that person toward better rule, but we could not resist them. We certainly couldn't attack them. All right, so absolute obedience on the one hand. In contrast to these theorists of divine right sovereignty, resistance theorists attack precisely these tenets of absolute obedience and the divinity of earthly magistrates. They counter that biblical and state laws instead favor resistance against tyranny. Specifically, they claim that the power of the monarch is limited in two ways. First, and I think this is interesting for you all as, as lawyers and law students. First, the coronation oath represents a contract between the king and his people, which, when broken, could result in his lawful deposition. <coughs> and second, the authority of kings derives from popular consent, not God. In Vindicii Contra Tyrannos, for example, Mornay argues that kings and subjects enter into a contractual relationship – 
In failing to uphold this contract, the tyrant should be removed. Quote, there is a mutual and reciprocal obligation between the people and the prince. The one promises to be a good and wise prince, the other to obey faithfully, provided he govern justly. Therefore, if the prince fail in his promise, the people are exempt from obedience. The contract is made void, the right of obligation of no force. According to this theory of government by contract, tyranny absolves the subjects of allegiance. Indeed, to protect the law and the state, subjects must rebel against the tyrant in order to restore order. Quote, it is therefore permitted the officers of a kingdom to suppress a tyrant, and it is not only lawful for them to do it, but their duty expressly requires it. Theodore de Biza offers similar arguments against the encroaching power of Catholic tyranny. As a French Calvinist theologian, Biza vigorously defended the rights of those reformed citizens living in France, welcoming them into Geneva after the St. Bartholomew's Day massacre. He, like Mornay, views the king as a servant of the Commonwealth. Quote, people are not created for their rulers, but rulers rather for their people. Biza supports Elizabeth's rule against the alleged tyranny of Philip II. Nevertheless, in Biza's formulation, no earthly leader should be obeyed without question. And even a private individual, he says, must use all his strength to defend his country from attack from tyranny. Mornay and Biza, in insisting on the contractual nature of kingship and the right to resist tyranny, offers arguments resonant with a manuscript which circulated in England in the mid-1590s, just before the composition and performance of Shakespeare's play. Like other resistance theorists, the author of this manuscript, called The State of Christendom, the author's likely Anthony Bacon, but it's attributed to Sir Henry Wooten in some of the initial scholarship. This manuscript was pretty recently found. The author of this manuscript argues that the tyrant is no longer a legitimate ruler, regardless of his divine appointment. Quote, for although a king be called God's minister, and his judgments seem to proceed from God's own mouth, yet when he doth wrong and breaks God's commandments, he is not then God's minister, but the devil's, and then he is no judge, no king. These arguments for resistance in the state of Christendom are directed against Spain, and the text is filled with attacks on Philip, calling him one who, whose, quote, nature is to command imperiously, to rule proudly, and to govern tyrannically. The author works to a crescendo in the argument against Philip when he offers an extended meditation on the Spaniards' potential rule in England. And this is a long quote. It is hard to say what course Philip would take and how he would govern if he should chance to prevail against England. But I think he would make all things new, as he himself shall be new. He will appoint a new government and new governors. He will build new laws, new orders, new customs, build up new citadels and pluck down old castles, kill our nobility and place Spaniards in their rooms take away all ancient privileges, plant his religion and banish ours, impose new tribute, and charge the subject with strange impositions. Briefly set spies in every city, in every village, in every town, in every hamlet, and in every house to mark what is done or said, what is counseled or practiced. Behold, this is all that he can do. The author articulates an extended nightmare which helps illuminate the atmosphere of the mid-1590s. Precisely at this moment, subjects feared a tyrant might succeed Elizabeth, and such tyranny would inevitably provoke resistance. So the author goes on to say, quote, but our countrymen would rather die than endure all this, or if they endure it for a time, will undoubtedly both seek and find means to free themselves from such servitude in short time. 
The analysis of law, tyranny, and succession in the state of Christendom and other resistance tracts serves to challenge Spanish tyranny, supporting the peaceable government of Elizabeth against its foreign enemies. But of course, by the 1590s, such arguments for resistance appear in a different, more challenging context as well. Their arguments are taken up by Catholic writers Parsons and Allen, both of whom shift the accusation of tyranny from Spain to England. Robert Parsons, A Conference Against the Next Succession, published in England, dedicated to the Earl of Essex, and precisely contemporaneous with the state of Christendom, the manuscript I just discussed, is undoubtedly the most incendiary of these Catholic resistance tracts. As, as with Biza and Mornay, Parsons attacks the tyranny of lawless rule. And like Wooten or Bacon, Parsons justifies resistance against monarchs who trespass the law. Further, like the state of Christendom, the text addresses an English audience. But it does so to argue for Philip II and the Infanta against Elizabeth's alleged tyranny. These two tracts thus offer similar arguments to entirely different purposes, upholding entirely opposite claimants. So the state of Christendom upholds James VI, Parsons <coughs> upholds Philip II. Uh, the state of Christendom attacks Spain, Parsons attacks England. Constructing an analogy between Elizabeth and Richard II, a conference against the next succession traces Richard's tyranny, exposing how the king trespassed law and creative innovated, created innovative statutes to prop up his reign. Parsons then considers the contrasting rule of Henry IV. While Richard broke his contractual obligation to the Commonwealth, Parsons argues, Henry upheld the law. Richard and Henry thus represent opposite models of government. Richard's government is tyrannical, illegal, and therefore legitimate. Henry's government is law-based, accountable, and therefore sanctioned by God and Parliament. The contrast between these kings, and indeed the central role of Richard and Henry to Parsons' argument, has led critics, including myself in an earlier publication, to read Shakespeare's Richard II next to Parsons' pamphlet, positioning both as forms of late Elizabethan resistance theory. So in other words, Parsons publishes a pamphlet the year before Shakespeare's play, in which he basically says that Elizabeth is like Richard II, a tyrant, and that instead we should have a law-based form of rule in Henry IV. So Henry IV, Bolingbroke, was right to topple and, uh, and murder Richard II through a he doesn't directly murder him. But anyway. In widening out the discussion of the tyrannicide debates to include Protestant as well as Catholic resistance theory, however, I am establishing a much more pressing fear of tyranny, not as experienced in the present through Elizabeth, but as posited for the future in the form of an as yet unestablished and potentially absolutist ruler. To depict a tyrant in 1595 signals not Elizabeth, but her successor. And to stage a tyrant in a public theater, as Shakespeare does, is to ask a range of English men and women to consider how they might respond to such tyranny were it to confront them in what they could only imagine would be the very near future. Part three, Shakespeare's theory. The portrait of Richard II as a tyrant appears in all of Shakespeare's source texts. In Mirror for Magistrates, for example, with his evil governance, Richard renteth right and law asunder. I am a king that ruled all by lust, he claims. Uh, the, here, lust is not specifically sexual, I might add, but includes a general appetite for indulging his will through pleasure. He punishes the peers and nobles with death exile and grievous fines to support his spending. And this phrasing, a king who rules by lust, not law, precisely echoes the definition of tyranny rehearsed in Bracton, Bodan, and others above. Richard's rule in Edward Hall's chronicle containing the histories of England, which is another source for Shakespeare, caused, quote, daily more and more the realm to fall into ruin and desolation in a manner irrecuperable as long as King Richard either lived or reigned. Neither law, justice, nor equity could take place where the king 
King's willful will was bent upon any wrongful purpose, Holinshed claims in his Chronicles of England, another source. Each of these writers, while remaining sympathetic to Richard as England's legitimate sovereign, depict the political chaos created by his abuse of law. Shakespeare's play, like his source texts, depicts Richard's tyranny. Richard suspends legal proceedings, banishes his countrymen on dubious causes, and seizes the estate of nobles, all examples of tyrannical rule cataloged in 1 Samuel and stretching forward through Calvin, Biza, Mornay, Bodin, and James. But Shakespeare's play, as I will now suggest, stands apart. It offers not an answer to the problem of tyranny, but a spectacle of it, a theory of politics. Most obviously, while Shakespeare's contemporaries probe the king's tyrannical actions and offer theorems condemning or bolstering him, Shakespeare theorizes a source of origin for, for Richard's tyranny. Shakespeare meditates deeply on the king's errancy, probing not just the king's tyrannical actions, but also investigating their origin. What? Shakespeare asks, causes Richard's suspension of law. What prompts Richard to flaunt custom? Shakespeare answers these questions directly, the divine right of kings. Shakespeare introduces the political theory of the divine right of kings in the play's second scene. Notably, this scene has no precedent in Shakespeare's source material. It also serves a limited dramatic purpose. The audience is informed of Gloucester's death in the opening scene, discussed above, so this second scene provides no new information. Further, it features a minor character, the Duchess of Gloucester, who never appears again. What, then, is the function of this innovative scene? It, it accomplishes one thing. It precisely outlines the model of divine right kingship practiced by Richard and initially followed by his subjects who are forced in their passivity to consent to his tyrannical rule. When the Duchess of Gloucester reproaches Gaunt for failing to revenge her husband's death, Gaunt replies, so just in a nutshell, Richard murdered this nobleman, the Duke of Gloucester, and his wife is now trying to whip up support for herself uh, in the form of Gaunt, saying, you have to do something, the king can't murder my husband, you know, please help me. And Gaunt says, I can't help you. And this is why he says he can't help. Quote, and these are also pretty famous lines. God's is the quarrel, for God's substitute, his deputy anointed in his sight, hath caused his death, for which, if wrongfully, let heaven revenge for I may never lift an angry arm against his minister. And we can think about that in terms of our conversation yesterday about revenge, right? Let heaven revenge, for I may never lift an angry arm against his minister. This short speech effectively rehearses the three central tenets of divine right. First, Gaunt claims that the king has been divinely ordained. The king is God's substitute, his deputy anointed in his sight. Second, the sovereignty of the king is unrestrained by earthly law. Richard has caused Gloucester's death, for which, if wrongfully, let heaven revenge. Third, Gaunt articulates a doctrine of non-resistance and passive obedience. He cannot resist the king, even in these extreme circumstances. I may never lift an angry arm against his minister. These three tenets, namely absolute obedience, the appointment of kings by God, and the subordination of law to sovereignty, are cornerstones of divine right theory. The second scene with Gaunt thus serves an important function. It demonstrates a political belief in and consensus around the doctrine of divine right of kings in Richard's England. This doctrine was familiar to Shakespeare's audience, as suggested above, being rehearsed in a homily <coughs> against willful, obedient, uh, willful uh, rebellion and disobedience, a text delivered to congregants from the pulpit by government order. Through Gaunt's speech, Shakespeare sketches what would be a very familiar political credo. Uh, 
but he also investigates this credo in a theatrical context, which exposes its significant political problems. First, in the figure of Gaunt, the dictum of absolute obedience is strained to the breaking point. With his son banished and his estate seized immediately after his death, the figure of loyalist Gaunt exposes the dangers of absolute obedience for subjects. Such obedience only gives the tyrant a wider berth for lawless rule. Further, Shakespeare exposes the danger of divine right monarchy for good rule. This theory of sovereignty might seem to assure Richard of his godly power, but the exaggerated distance between king and subject, far from ennobling the office of monarch, instead endangers the kingdom because Richard cannot negotiate with his people without calling into question the ideological underpinnings of his office. Richard's attachment to the theory of the divine right of kings makes him inflexible to challenge or change. Finally, Shakespeare investigates divine right in a theatrical context which exposes its inherently figurative rather than literal or legal power. For the divine right of kings essentially hinges on a metaphor. As with all metaphors, it establishes a comparison between two otherwise unrelated objects, in this case, Richard and God. As is obvious to Shakespeare's audience, God saves, Richard murders. God grants, Richard seizes. The more that the figurative nature of this political formula is exposed due to the extreme distance of God and Richard, the less convincing it appears as a doctrine demanding obedience. That is to say, by placing the political philosophy of the divine right of kings in the mouth of an errant theatrical character, Shakespeare exposes this political view as a rhetorical and imaginative construct. Divine right is hardly a political fact, nor is it law. Instead, it is a fiction a metaphorical construction which the king deploys to trespass law and exercise his tyranny. In drawing attention to the language of the divine right of kings, it might seem that I'm covering familiar ground. After all, critics have long recognized the role of sanctified kingship in Shakespeare's play. But in line with Kantorowicz, scholars have tended to analyze Richard's model of sovereignty as part of a tragic medieval narrative. With Richard comes the demise of sacred kingship, so pointedly chronicled by Gaunt. Quote, this royal throne of kings, this sceptered isle, this earth of majesty, this seat of Mars, this other Eden, demi-paradise, is now leased out. He betrays a commitment not merely to medieval mystical kingship, but to a contemporary early modern political doctrine. The medieval theory of sanctified kingship had no political teeth, but the early modern doctrine of the divine right of kings did. The doctrine was developed, as I suggested below, in the wake of the Reformation in order to establish Henry VIII and Elizabeth's direct relation to God, independent of the pope or earthly law. Richard, in the mode of a post-Reformation ruler, and in concert with the writings of James, Bodin, and others, is confident of precisely such divinity. He believes that the monarch is appointed by God, rules above the law, and commands absolute obedience from his subjects. But this metaphorical yoking of God and king comes unhinged as Richard calls on God in the play and receives no answer, as I will now suggest. This political danger of divine right for sovereigns appears most clearly in Act Three of the play when Richard returns from Ireland to deal with the rebellion of Bolingbroke. Landing on the Welsh coast, Richard repeatedly voices the principles of divine right of kings, but with increasing desperation and to no effect. Rather than marshalling soldiers to his aid, he conjures divine spirits. Quote, this earth shall have a feeling and these stones proved armed soldiers, ere her native king shall falter under foul rebellion's arms. So he doesn't call forward an army. He just thinks that the stones will turn into people who support him because he has this kind of divine power. 
Richard's speech elicits among his loyal followers a kind of reckless repetition of the theory of divine right, which comes to serve as a substitute for political action. To Richard's lines, the Bishop of Carlisle responds, the power that made you king hath power to keep you king in spite of all, namely God. Bolstered by Carlisle, Richard further rehearses his divine connection. He is the anointed king who cannot be toppled by shrewd steel. He says, quote, not all the water in the rough rude sea can wash the balm from an anointed king. The breath of worldly men cannot depose the deputy elected by the Lord. For every man that Bolingbroke hath pressed to lift shrewd steel against our golden crown, God, for his Richard, hath in heavenly pay a glorious angel. So there's this rebellion that is burrowing down on Richard at this exact moment, and he takes the time on this Welsh coast to offer all of these speeches about his divinity and how stones and angels are going to help him. But no sooner does he articulate his own divinity than he suffers the humiliating announcement of yet more defecting subjects. When the king defends his balmed body, Salisbury reports the desertion of 20,000 soldiers. When Richard rebounds, asking... Is not the king's name 20,000 names? Arm, arm, my name. Scroop enters to confirm to Richard that Richard's subjects, quote, both young and old rebel, and all goes worse than I have power to tell. In the scene on the Welsh coast, Richard voices the fantasy of divine right monarchy. But by the end of the scene, the inadequacy of this theory is evident and Richard proves willing to surrender the throne to an enemy who has not even materialized. Of Shakespeare's sources, only Holinshed portrays Richard as a divinely anointed king. Mirror for Magistrates and Hall's Chronicles instead emphasize Richard's tyranny. But if Shakespeare, like Holinshed, rehearses the divinity of kings, he does so to starkly different effect shaping his Richard both as a divinely anointed king and as a tyrant. Thus, unlike Holinshed, who condemns the king's depositions on the ground of his divine appointment, Shakespeare depicts again and again the link between the king's faith in his divinity and his political tyranny. Disregarding the counsel or breath of his subjects, Shakespeare's Richard claims that law and authority lie in his breast alone. Furthermore, this theory of divine right appears as merely empty rhetoric, since Richard invokes heavenly angels on the Welsh coast only to receive news of defecting subjects. If faith in the rhetoric of divine right replaces prudent military action, such faith equally replaces skills of political negotiation. Shakespeare stages for a mere moment in Act Three a solution to Richard's crisis the king agrees to return Bolingbroke's inheritance. This compromise does not exist in any of Shakespeare's sources, but Shakespeare dramatizes a peaceful ending when Richard claims that Bolingbroke is, quote, welcome hither and all the number of his fair demands shall be accomplished without contradiction. These brief lines hint at a peaceful resolution and a way from the familiar bloody history of war that follows and which Shakespeare staged in his first tetralogy. What prevents such reconciliation? Richard does, or rather, Richard's faith in the divinity of kings does. He cannot reconcile his own notion of royalty with capitulation to Bolingbroke's demands. Instead, he knew no sooner considers this compromise than he cries out to God, in the first of a series of speeches that question the status of kingship. Oh, that I were as great as is my grief, or that I could forget what I have been. It is his inability to forget his own divine right that makes any compromise impossible. He is aligned with God omnipotent, he says, and he should be subject to no hand of blood and bone. Either he holds the singular force of the sun in his divine scepter, or he grasps, as he puts it, a palmer's walking staff. Having momentarily considered a compromise, Richard then recoils. To compromise, as Richard says, is to debase ourselves. Subjected thus, 
How can you say to me, I am king? It is this exaggerated sense of his own exceptionalism that prohibits Richard from engaging in the play's political world at all. He recalls his divinity and chooses over compromise a dramatic Christological exit. He embraces a kind of martyrdom, being a hermit, a palmer, or a monk. Realizing that Bolingbroke's resistance is too strong and that he must forego his claim to divinely sanctioned absolute monarchy, Richard seeds the throne with maximum pathos. What shall the king now do now? Must he submit? The king shall do it. Although the events of Richard's deposition are well known to the audience, his sudden fall proves shocking. Confident of his own divinity, only 50 lines earlier, Richard relinquishes his power without warning. But in doing so, he continues to view himself as exceptional and indeed divine. Deprived of the crown, Richard adopts the role of a latter-day man of sorrows. He characterizes himself as the son of God. He is Apollo's Phaeton, or more potently, Jesus. His former followers are Judas to his Christ. They are pilots delivering him to a sour cross. The deposition scene thus represents the culmination of the play's sustained exposure of the divine right of kings as a failed political philosophy. What happens to a king whose own theory of sovereignty fails? What happens is that Richard tries briefly after, after his deposition to connect himself to his subjects. He describes himself as one of two buckets on either side of the crown, or as he puts it, in prison, he's the clock that marks time for the new King Henry, counting down the hours. Most spectacularly, he deems himself to be one of a group of traitors threatening the crown. But no sooner has he grouped himself with his subjects than he swings back to memories of his singularity. Was this the face that, like the sun, did make beholders wink? Here, Richard returns to the image of himself as the sun, as Phaeton, which characterizes his mode of sovereign rule. Even as he struggles to come to terms with his fall then, his lyrical speeches recapitulate his quasi-divinity, which is precisely the reason for his failed kingship in the first place. In prison, Richard sees himself as the origin of a universe. He uses his own brain to produce a kingdom of still-breeding thoughts, and these same thoughts people this little world. Similarly, in a, a famous moment, he breaks a mirror and thus creates a kingdom of many faces, all reflections of his own. Richard's mind still turns over the remnants of his former philosophy, examining how he might retain divinity in this new political environment where he has be become subject not only to Bolingbroke, but to mortality. So part four, Shakespeare's conclusion. And this is uh, heading toward the end. Having witnessed the play's sustained argument against Richard's political philosophy, an audience might fairly expect, and Parsons suggests that we will expect, to hear a counter-argument on the merits of <coughs> Bolingbroke or Henry IV. And certainly, Henry IV receives popular support. And in the brief representation of his rule, he appears to govern through consultation with advisors, and he rules under the law. In many respects, then, Bolingbroke appears to exercise the law-based customary rule of the king in parliament. Yet one of the more surprising features of the play is the difficulty Bolingbroke faces from the moment he ascends the throne. Indeed, Shakespeare spends the last two acts of the play depicting Bolingbroke's struggle to maintain authority. Infectious conflict erupts among his nobles, his son Henry is truant, and O'Merrill enters into open rebellion. In the play's final scene, we learn that rebels burn the town of Cirencester, while the new king executes Salisbury, Spencer, Blunt, Kent, Brockus, Sir Bennet Seeley, and the abbot of Westminster, all traitors to the throne. One might reasonably ask why Shakespeare chooses to represent Bolingbroke's difficulties in such condensed detail. And the answer to this question lies where we began, in the succession crisis. The problem with the succession crisis, as the final act of Shakespeare's play reveals, is that it never ends. Initiated by the tyrannical rule of Richard II, this crisis continues to haunt the state even when law-based customary rule has been restored. 
if the process of fair sequence and succession has been interrupted by Richard the Self, Richard the Second in his tyranny, or by Henry the Fourth in his treason, then political chaos ensues, no matter how skillful the subsequent monarch might be. Shakespeare reinforces the problem with succession by drawing attention to Henry's trouble with his own son. This unthrifty <coughs> heir seems to presage a multi-generational succession crisis as the country moves from tyrant to traitor to truant. Carlyle prophesizes precisely such chaos. Kin with kin and kind will ki with kind will confound. War, he says, in is inevitable. Disorder, horror, fear, and mutiny shall here inhabit, and this land be called the field of Golgotha and dead men's skulls. Whatever the response to tyranny, whether it is in the rebellion of resistance theory on the one hand or the obedience of divine right on the other, Shakespeare reveals that a succession crisis looms. Shakespeare does not have to stand as one of the range of Catholics or Protestant polemicists in order for him to offer a theory of tyranny and succession. If pamphleteers from Parsons to Biza write instrumentally, arguing in favor of one successor or another, Shakespeare, by contrast, writes imaginatively, and in doing so produces the most incisive political theory of his day. He exposes the dangerous rhetoric of divine right as an absolutist language, separating king from country. He links this political rhetoric with tyranny, thereby probing not just the effects of tyranny, but its causes. In its observation and resulting critique of divine right monarchy, Shakespeare's play is at once intensely politically engaged, weighing in on the most crucial topics of the day, such as uh, the source and danger of tyranny, and yet it is theoretical refusing to turn thea into theorem, drama into state instrument. If we examine the play through a strictly Elizabethan political lens, that is, seeing Richard as Elizabeth and Bolingbroke as one of the successors, then we join a group of recent historians eager to turn from idea to fact in the play. In doing so, the play's perspective shrinks and Shakespeare is merely asking us to take a side. The mere supposition that Elizabeth figures Richard seems to tip the playwright's hand, exposing the play as resistance theory. But to argue instead that the play engages questions of rule as a form of political theory, precisely at the moment when subjects face the specter of a new ruler, is to take more seriously the play's dramatic form and the opportunities offered by thea, theater, and political theory. To put this another way, this paper has suggested how Shakespeare stands back from endorsing a particular successor for England in the period of the 1590s political succession crisis. Instead, he chooses to investigate the origin of tyranny in absolutist monarchy and divine right sovereignty. And he further stages such sovereignty not merely as imaginative because he puts it on stage, but imaginative in its very conception. Divine right sovereignty is based in a strained metaphor, he reveals. Its proponents deal in questionable figures with no legal backing. Figurative language offers some of the play's most beautiful lines, but not its most insightful politics. Instead, the figurative language of divine right produces tyranny. Shakespeare exposes it as a metaphorical and arguably empty construction, powerful only insofar as the king's subjects agree to submit to it. Shakespeare's play thus uses theory, investigation, observation, and spectacle to inform its audience of political choices away from absolute obedience and tyranny. If the play fails to offer a clear solution to tyranny, a theorem such as absolute obedience or necessary resistance, it does offer an astute diagnosis of where tyranny comes from and of how and why rulers must avoid it. Most importantly, his play reveals how, through Thea, 
the spectacle of theater, his audience members might become intelligent observers, that is to say, theorists themselves. Thank you.